Now, the past few years have been dominated by headlines of an impending trade war between the United States and China. But while everyone is focused on the bilateral trade conflict between nations, this interpretation of trade wars is wrong, at least according to our guest, Matthew Klein. He's an economic journalist for Barron's, and according to his new book, Trade Wars Are Class Wars. And so in this interview, we're going to discuss how it's not the trade conflict between countries, but rather the inequality within countries that is at the source of trade conflict today. Welcome to Room for Discussion, Matthew Klein. Thank you very much for having me. Well, yeah, uh, indeed. So uh, I think we can, just before we dive into it, you know, we have a very diverse audience. Uh, some are economic students, other ones not so much. So uh, could you briefly explain for us in layman's terms the central argument of your book? So as you were saying, a lot of people, I think, looked at the news events of the past few years and thought there was some kind of fundamental economic conflict between China and the United States where Chinese workers were benefiting at the expense of American workers and Chinese companies benefiting at the expense of American companies. And our point is that that's not really the right way of thinking about this at all, that actually there, there were economic conflicts. There, there were things that happened that dispossessed a lot of people and people were reasonably upset about the things that happened to them. But it, it's thinking about it in terms of countries is really the wrong unit of analysis, that actually what happened was that Chinese elites and American elites effectively cooperated with each other in a way that harmed ordinary people in both China and the United States. And that, in fact, what really happened was that, in particular, the Chinese government uh, instituted a variety of policies uh, with the cooperation of its own you know, business elites and the Communist Party in a way that was transferring income and spending power away from ordinary Chinese workers and retirees. And that a side effect of this was to harm people in the rest of the world, particularly in the United States. Well, thank you for that very clear uh, summary of your central argument. In this interview, we want to break it down uh, for our audience to go step by step and then um, we'll explore all of the different components that has been uh, argued in your book uh, to understand better understand how class wars uh, are actually, uh, well, how class wars are trading trade wars. Now, let's start with one of your, I think one of the biggest focuses is on the inequality of uh, inequality and precisely how the distribution of income has been, uh, well, just disturbed over the last few decades uh, in countries like China, and this is tr uh, causing the train conflicts. So the question now is, what is a, how does inequality relate to underconsumption, and what is the relationship between underconsumption in a country and excess savings? They're all great questions. So the, the basic starting point, and this is just uh, you know, an empirical fact that we've seen repeatedly across societies and across time, is that most people spend everything that they earn over the course of their lives. Maybe there are particular points in their life they're saving more or spending more, but over the course of their life, they basically spend everything they earn. The exception are people at the very, very top of the income distribution. And the reason for this is sort of intuitive, which is that there's only so many things that you can spend on good. There are only so many goods and services you can consume. So even if you have very expensive tastes, if you are earning so much money at a given point in time, you're going to end up with an excess and some extra amount. And that is used in, in, to buy assets. That's, you know, if you're not buying goods and services, you're buying assets. That could be bank accounts, that could be real estate, could be you know, equity, it could be also art, right? But that's essentially you know, what, what happens. And so if you have, you, you look at the data over time and across countries, you see that the saving rate of very, very high income households is much higher than for everyone else. And then in fact, you can basically divide any population into two, which is essentially like sort of the top, you know, 0.1% of the income distribution, and then everyone else. And, you know, everyone else is basically the same savings rate of somewhere between sort of zero and 10%. And then people at the very top, it's, you know, 50% or more. And so what that implies, of course, is that if you have a, you know, nothing else changes, and this is a key point, but if nothing else changes, and you have a shift in distribution of income from, you know, the vast majority of the population to this very high saving cohort, then you're going to end up having greater demand for financial assets than you otherwise would have, and probably a greater creation of it. That's a little more complex. So that's that's a key part of the argument. The other key part of the argument, which I, you know is sort of the, the necessary uh, component here, is that all income ultimately comes from spending on goods and services. That uh, you know, you can't just earn income from nothing. Someone has to be buying something somewhere. Companies' sales come from other people, you know, buying things. Obviously, you can't, you can't, and, and profits, of course, are going to be coming from that as well. So, 
ultimately what this means is that if you want to if you have some kind of shift in the income distribution that reduces income that would go towards uh, the consumption of goods and services, then either total consumption of goods and services goes down, or you have to have some kind of offsetting force, uh, most obviously an increase in debt that can finance the purchases of goods and services that would have otherwise been you know, bought out of income. And so one of the things we've seen, again, historically and across uh, countries, is that when you have a big increase in income concentration at the very top, whether it's uh, the United States in the 1920s or other parts of the world, including the U.S. and say like 1980 to you know, 2007, that these periods of income concentration coincide with big increases in household and government indebtedness. And whether that's because you know individual people are taking out more credit card debt or they're borrowing against their homes or whether governments um, are effectively borrowing on their behalf, essentially using government deficits you know, to provide income supplements to people who haven't seen income growth so that they can consume, whatever the exact mechanism, this is something that we've seen repeatedly. And you know the nuance we add in, in the book here is that these shifts don't necessarily occur equally across countries. So what you could have, and we have seen, is that an increase in inequality in one society does not necessarily mean that that society experiences the increase in indebtedness. And two of the major economies that we look at in our book, China and Germany, in fact, you see the opposite happen uh, for certain periods, where in fact the increase in indebtedness occurs outside. Um, and that shows up in the form of trade imbalances. And, and that essentially is one of the reasons why people you know, within a particular society might not even realize the, the mechanism or the link that's connecting them. And that's you know, what we try to do in the book is essentially show how everyone is connected in this global system. And so changes in one place will have an effect somewhere else, even if it's not immediately apparent you know, why that is. Right. So before we can dive into the policies that have created these changes in specific countries that have led to inequality, just as a clarification, we can just understand savings as any type of like uh, income that we have not consumed, correct? Yeah, there are basically two ways of defining savings that economists use, and they both have some issues, but essentially one is, you know, you earn money. Uh, and then the money you spend on goods and services is consumption, and then anything else is savings. So if you use it, you know, the, the technical definition is like if you use that to buy a house, for example, that's saving. Um, you might not think about it that way, but that's the, then the other version of savings, which is supposed to be consistent, is, you know, there's a world we produce, you know, ex, you, know you think of some very, very primitive agrarian society, and it produ- you know, you grow like 100 bushels of corn, and then you eat 80 bushels of corn. The other 20 bushels, if you store it in a warehouse, that's saving. And so uh, those things are supposed to be broadly consistent. They're two different definitions. We talk about them both in the book, but that's essentially, that's, that's right. Um, you can think of it as simply what's not being consumed immediately on goods and services is sort of the yeah. straightforward, that's the, the cor- precise, correct definition. <laughs> okay. All right, that, that makes sense indeed. So if we look, for instance, at uh, China, you know, we've seen unprecedented levels of growth, but at the same time, as you point out, you know, Chinese workers are taking home about 40% of the value of what they produce compared to workers in the West who are taking home around 70%. And of course, this is driving this, you know, underconsumption and excess savings. So what kind of policies or how did China, you know, get to this point? So the thing that is really striking about, and this actually segues from your previous question about savings, is that when we think about investment in, you know, productive capacity and capital goods, that ostensibly comes out of savings. So if, the, if there are only so many workers and so much land and so many machines in a society at any point in time, all of those you know, productive units can either be used, can either be uh, working towards the production of consumer goods or something else. And to the extent that it's something else that you know might be you know a factory that in the in the immediate period you know is not good for anybody, but once it's finished being built, it can produce more things and everyone's better off. That's you know investment. And so the the the, the major feature of China's development since about 1978 or so has been a very very strong focus from all layers of government on promoting investment uh, to the detriment of consumption. And in the beginning, this made a lot of sense because you look at the history of, of mainland China basically going back to you know 1800 or so, and it's almost a constant period of either foreign invasion or civil war or revolution. And you have a situation where a relatively advanced and developed society is just, for unfortunate circumstances, dramatically underinvested in physical capital. So it's a relatively educated society, a rel- you know other, other advantages, but really underinvested. And so um, 
at that point in time, if you really anything you can do to increase investment in physical capital is going to lead to really big productivity gains. And so that's what they did. And this was not something that they invented. There other societies have done this before. I mean, you saw it in um, Japan and, and South Korea as well. And essentially, the, you know, the short version is you if you can figure out a way to transfer transfer uh, real resources and income away from households who would spend it on consumer goods, then uh, you can you direct it either to local governments that will invest in infrastructure directly or state on enterprises or businesses that are affiliated with the state and, and engaged in, you know, following the directives of the of the party, whatever, you know, these things aren't that you know, meaningfully different, then you can end up having a, uh, a big increase in investment. And if you do it correctly, then everyone ends up being better off. You can think of it as uh, trickle down economics, where even if the share of economic output going to workers is falling, that the total amount of economic output is rising so quickly that people don't mind. Yeah, yeah. And can you provide and, a specific example of this transfer of income, for example? Yeah, I so I mean, China... probably the most notorious case um, and, and, and is the, you know, the, the way that, uh, you know, seizures of land, that local governments essentially would just take land or, you know, buy land at extremely depressed prices from uh, farmers and others and then, you know, give it to developers and then it would be turned into, you know, shopping complexes or factories or offices or housing blocks or what have you. And over time, I mean, clearly, you know, you have, that's how the cities were built. But at the same time, the people who, you know, had their land taken from them, essentially, they, you know, they were expropriated. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. one example. Um, you have the fact that labor, adversarial labor unions are illegal. Um, there are labor unions in China, but they don't really work the way labor unions are supposed to work. Um, and you have labor rights. There's, there's a, a tremendous amount of forced labor in China. We've been seeing that more recently um, in Xinjiang very clearly with Uyghurs. Um, the, you can look at the way the environmental regulation works, where, I mean, it's not something that we normally think of as part of necessarily relating to trade policy or things of this nature. But at the end of the day, if a company is able to pollute, then you have a couple things happening. One is that they're essentially you know, subsidizing their own profits at the expense of everyone who lives nearby. And all the people who live there are going to be saddled with higher healthcare costs in the future. Yeah. And if they're aware of that, then they have to save more and spend less. And even if they're not, then, you know, it's going to show up sooner or later. And so, you know, the fact that you, you're able to promote, you know, the construction of a lot of very um, polluting industries and the, the, the shift of polluting industries into China as a consequence of this, I mean, that's clearly a situation where you're favoring the interests of business, business over workers and, and profits over uh, wages. So, there, I mean, th these are among the things we discuss. I mean, there are issues with the Chinese tax system as well. But there, there's just a lot of things that, that are done that were clearly meant to um, promote and encourage investment at the expense of ordinary people's lifestyles. And nonetheless, you also mentioned that there are any limits to any unbalanced growth model like China's in your book. So an investment-led model only works in so far investments are actually worthwhile and they are profitable to the people doing those investments. So for example, uh, we found out while doing research that China has invested billions uh, uh, creating and developing ghost cities, basically infrastructure that no one is using. What are the effects of this wasted investment on China's politics and economics? So there are a couple of, of things. One, which has been very clear, is that since about 2008, so in other words, once uh, it became much more difficult for China to essentially, or Chinese companies, I should say, to essentially dump the, the debt problems associated with this on the rest of the world through trade uh, because of the collapse of <clears throat> the US and European economies, that you see a massive increase in debt within China. And uh, it's basically the largest and fastest increase in um, total debt to income in any you know, major economy ever um, in, in the years after 2008 in China. So that's one immediate consequence. The other consequence, which is tougher to, to measure, but I mean, we have to know that it's there, is that you know, there's a foregone opportunity. So there's a book that very recently came out I, the name the name escapes me, but it, it does a very good job of describing what life is like in rural China, and you know a lot of the impression that that we have of China is based on you know the wealthy coastal parts, and you know like many countries, there's there's a you know a wealthier urban coastal yeah. section, and then there's like a hinterland that maybe isn't as economically well off, and in China it's no different, and that's a very very large part of the country and a very large part of the population, and uh, it's it's you know dispiriting to see that there's you know very basic issues of, of public health or education or things like that that aren't really being addressed and you think about the money and material resources that went into building 
things that may not have been as valuable when it could have been, you know, gone to these other issues that would have affected the well-being of hundreds of millions of Chinese people. And that's, I mean, you know, you can't necessarily you know, put an economic, you know, you know, dollar renminbi impact on that, but it's, it's clearly a cost that's associated with this. All right. Now, China is obviously not the only country that's, you know, doing this. Some of the policies you mentioned, you know, land expropriation, etc., that's obviously not possible in a democracy. And we've also seen, for instance, uh, a similar phenomenon happening in Germany. So what kind of policies that are being implemented in Germany that are, you know, depressing uh, consumption and creating excess savings? So one of the reasons we wanted to cover a couple of different major economies is precisely because there isn't only one, you know, cause of, of these imbalances. And, and, you know, Germany, obviously, for a lot of people, does not seem you know, it's not like China, right? There are very, very clear differences in the political system, the economic system of yeah. China, and yet you end up with, in certain respects, you know, similar outcomes. And so that's one of the reasons things we wanted to explore and explain to people. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot going on there, but the 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 short version is is twofold. One is that German businesses basically reacted to um, the events of the 1990s by uh, just refusing to invest domestically um, and pay workers more until relatively recently. And then sort of in co cooperation with German businesses, the German government sort of informed by talking with business leaders concluded that the solution to the problems of unemployment that developed after 1989 was essentially to cut welfare benefits. And that if you, you know, more or less force people to work by making it untenable to not be working, then you will lower, you know, mechanically that will lower unemployment. Um, it doesn't improve people's living standards because, you know, they, they have a wage, but they have less welfare. So they're sort of in the same position. But, you know, and it doesn't improve productivity because the jobs they're getting are very low paid and not particularly, you know, value added. But it does reduce your headline unemployment rate and it does make the federal budget balance and I guess the state budget balance as well look better. And that's, you know, what they did. And so the net effect of this is that German living standards grew much less than they should have over the past, you know, 20 plus years, because essentially um, governments didn't invest. There was, you know, so there's, it's one of the big, in, you know, the people, where I'm from in the United States, we talk about infrastructure, you know, being underinvested all the time. And that's certainly true. Within a European context, Germany is like the United States in, the, in this context. And, you know, compared to all of its neighbors, you know, the road systems are quite poor. The train systems are quite poor. The internet system is quite poor. Um, the energy delivery system is quite poor. Uh, so, you know, there's clearly been a cost to all those things. The business is underinvested. And, you know, consumption workers you know living standard you know the or, uh, living standards of ordinary people whether they're workers or retirees the fact that the poverty rate in germany went up in a period when unemployment is going down and this is before um you know the financial crisis and the euro crisis i mean that that really is a sig signifier and a signal i think of, of sort of the the weaknesses of this policy regime and that of course had cascading effects for everyone else because if german companies many of which are just you know selling the same things to people in the rest of the world they always were but people in Germany are just spending less for various reasons, then the net effect of this is that you have a big increase in the profitability of German companies because they're cutting their costs and a big increase in debt outside of Germany and a big shift in the trade balance. And that's, those are all the things that, that we saw. And, um, you know, that's not good for, I mean, I guess it's good for the owners of those companies, but otherwise it's not particularly good for anyone either inside or outside Germany, the vast majority anyway. No, indeed, because you focus very much indeed on this notion of underconsumption as what's driving, you know, the trade surplus of countries like Germany. But, you know, if you look at Germany, of course, it's a member of the euro, which means that for Germany, it has a sort of undervalued currency, which makes its exports more competitive. So how do you factor some of these, you know, other factors that are enhancing Germany's uh, export, competitive, uh, export competitiveness into your analysis? So that's certainly true, although I'd point out that, you know, for much of the early period of the euro, you could argue that Germany was sort of in the reverse situation, that interest rates, for example, in Germany are probably higher than they should have been um, because you have a period where Germany is basically the, the weakest, most sluggishly growing economy in the euro area. A very different situation from, say, Spain uh, or Greece or, or even the sort of the median euro area country like France. Um, and so, but they had the same set of interest rates and the same currency. And so Germany was Germans were hit pretty hard by that, you know, so there's sort of these offsetting factors there. And of course, it doesn't also explain the relationship between Germany and, and its neighbors. I mean, there's no reason to think that German exports growing are the problem. I mean, German exports grew more slowly after 2000 than they did before 2000. The bigger problem is that the weakness of import growth. And, 
you know, it, it's certainly possible that if the euro were stronger, you'd see Germans importing more things, German consumers. But it seems like the bigger problem there is, is not that. I mean, after all, the euro relative to the dollar, I mean, basically doubled between 2002 and 2008, right? And that did not coincide at all with a change in German consumer behavior. In fact, that coincided with the period of the weakest consumption growth in Germany. So I, I don't think that that in and of itself is a sufficient explanation. Right. You also mentioned earlier that German savings could have been used to increase its own living standards, but that businesses uh, had not invested domestically despite rising profitability and, had, and contrary to that, have invested abroad even though they had been making losses. Why is this? So there are a couple factors there. I mean, one that's sort of a challenging thing is that, you know, if your consumer market is weak, you know, you don't want to be the only business that's trying to invest more, you know, to produce more for your home market. If everyone did it at the same time, then that's, you know, that would work out well for you. But otherwise, you're just going to be sort of stuck out there on a limb. You've borrowed the money, you've put, you know, you've done the capital spending, and then there's no extra demand for it. So, you know, I have some sympathy for them at sort of the individual level. It, it sort of comes down to, you know, there, there had been actually, you know, in the late 1990s, a bit of a tech bubble in Germany, and they, there had been an investment boom. And then that ended quite badly for them, as it did, you know, in the United States and, and other countries. And the German business response to this was to cut back pretty aggressively, which was similar to what we saw in the United States over the same period, by the way. The, the, the key thing is that this wasn't offset by something else. So, I mean, sort of standard macroeconomic policymaking is that you have these cycles of business investment, and the government should be trying to offset this. This is people been at least at least since Keynes people have been talking about this if not before so this is not a controversial thing but they didn't and to be fair i mean some of that was constraints that had been imposed upon them i mean the constraints that they'd signed up for and, and you know german previous german governments had pushed for and you know with with maastricht and so forth but um nevertheless there were those constraints so interest rates were probably too high um there you know the budget deficit was you know there were limits there to what that could be done so that was kind of a tricky thing um you know, and, and in that environment, it's interesting that, you know, maybe they didn't, you know, maybe you could have raised wages or something with the, but, you know, there, there was, you know, if you're in the, if you're an individual family business, which is many of German companies were, are family owned businesses, like you, you don't really see, you're, you're thinking, well, this is a rough time, but at least my sort of sales, the rest of the world are growing. I'm going to, you know, just keep earning those profits. And then, you know, essentially what they did was they put them in the banking system. They didn't even invest, you know, there was there was some, you know, capital spending in, abroad and, you know, Central and Eastern Europe, but mostly it just went into, you know, the banks and then via the banks it went into things, you know, all sorts of wonderful projects like, you know, U.S. subprime mortgages and Greek government bonds and things <laughs> like that. So it really, yeah, it didn't, well. it didn't really benefit anyone particularly, I guess, except for, you know, a few German bankers. But yeah, I, I found it very interesting in your book that you uh, use a statistic to describe that if Germans had invested uh, domestically, their returns over the last, I think, 20 years would have been uh, much higher, much profitable than they had uh, invested abroad. Yeah. Now, let's uh, move on to the next logical step of your argument, which is what are the effects of this excess production savings uh, resulting from the inequality of distribution of income in countries like Germany and China, which we, we just have described. Uh, and then this capital flows, uh, you argue, move to other countries. And you specifically use the word force. They force the rest of the world to consume more. Now, how does this happen? Because that's not clear to me. Yeah. So force is a function of the fact that, you know, we're all, con I mean, the thing we say in the very beginning of the book is that everyone is connected through the global trade and financial systems, whether, you know, we know it or not, or fully appreciate it. Even if you're basically cut off from the rest of the world, like, uh, you know, North Korea or something, you're still connected to varying degrees. There are, there are trade. There's no completely self-sufficient autarkic cutoff society basically anywhere. And so what that means is that if you are suddenly consuming less stuff or people in your society are consuming less stuff, um, then that is going to some way or another have an impact on people in the rest of the world. Either those people are going to have to consume more in order to sort of balance things out, or they're going to have to, or they're going to produce the same and end up with an excess that can't be sold. And the businesses are going to go out of business and then they'll end up producing less. And those are really the only <laughs> the only choice. Or maybe you produce less. I guess that's the other. Yeah, you could, or you personally could produce less. And then you know, but th those are really the only options here. And so, if you take sort of as a given, which maybe we shouldn't, but if we take it as a given that in general, we you know societies are going to try to do what they can to prevent a lot of business you know businesses from going out of business to varying degrees, which I think is sort of a a reasonable baseline case. It's clearly not true all the time, but it's sort of a baseline case then 
a necessary consequence of one society cutting back on its consumption is that other societies will in fact be forced to consume more in order to preserve jobs and incomes and, and maintain demand for total the total amount of stuff being produced globally and uh, you know and that will happen in a variety of ways that will happen um, because the financial system will respond in such a way uh, because you know through you know I mean sort of the classic example is you have lower interest rates right um, you could have it as a function of automatic stabilizers government deficits would automatically expand because there's uh, a reduction in incomes of people from working maybe because their businesses are in fact you know having a harder time selling things so you have unemployment but then people get unemployment benefits and there's less tax revenue uh, coming in and that might show and that will show up as you know extra spending but also uh, you know potentially having a trade uh, balance outcome. So, I mean, that's that's sort of, I mean, there are a bunch of other mechanics we talk about. There are currency effects potentially. Uh, but essentially the idea, I mean, the very basic idea is that if, you know, these things do have to add up one way or another and that persistent imbalances between, um, you know, what's produced and then what is either consumed or used as an investment input are going to lead to, you know, accumulation of inventory that can't be sold. That leads to businesses going out of business. And so uh, that's not, or at least, you know, or at least the more production if you have excess consumption, but that's not a situation we've had in a very, very long time. So, you know, that's really the, the fundamental, the problem that occurs is if, if one society just reduces its own consumption without adjusting its own production proportionally. And by the way, we're not saying anyone should cut their own production. You know, there's plenty of poverty in the world. More stuff is good. Uh, but if they just cut their consumption back, then that creates a real pressure and a problem for people in the rest of the world. Yeah. But if we look at countries, for instance, like Spain and Greece, which are some of the countries you list who've taken on, you know, excessive debt because of all these capital flows coming in, are you sort of suggesting that these countries have no say over their spending levels? So, more or less, yes. Um, I'm not going to say, like, obviously everyone always has choices, but if we look at sort of the reasonable set of choices that could have been made at any point in time, and you look at the history of, of these things, which is, you know, which we talk about in, in various contexts. Um, I mean, Spain is a, is a really fascinating example, right? Because if you look at what happened basically between sort of late 1990s and 2008, you have this mass, essentially a windfall of tons of money flowing into Spain from the rest of the world, dramatic loosening of financial conditions in Spain. Spanish government does what sort of textbooks say the Spanish government should do, right? They, are running budget surpluses and their total, you know, debt to GDP goes way down over this period. It goes from like 50% to, you know, 20% or something. I mean, this is exactly sort of the, you know, stereotypical Germanic policy advice of how you should respond to the situation. But it's not enough because the Spanish private sector, um, you know, goes to town. And some of that stuff is useful, by the way. It's not as if everything was wasted in Spain. I mean, Spain developed probably one of the best high-speed rail networks in the world. Um, there's a lot of, you know, still valuable resort and beachfront property that was built up during this period in, in terms of real estate and housing. And of course, a lot of the housing that was built up seemed like it was reasonable because the population was growing and the population was growing in part because you had big immigration inflows from Latin America because Spain was growing so rapidly and creating construction jobs. So it seemed reasonable at the time. And it seemed like what they were doing was reasonable at the time. And the Bank of Spain, in fact, was trying to be, you know, prudential and, and raising, um, what was it? Counter-cyclical provisioning. And basically, basically, they were trying to make sure their banks were becoming relatively more conservative. Clearly, it wasn't enough, but like they were trying to do these things. They were following all of you know all the sort of the textbook advice, and yet it still wasn't sufficient. And uh, just because you have that much money coming in, I mean, what are, you know, there are always going to be people in society where if you suddenly come to them and say like, "We'll lend you a lot of money at rates that you know in, on terms that had never before been available to you," they'll say that sounds great, and then they will go out and do that. And that's what happened. And Greece is a slightly different scenario, but it wasn't that different. I mean, essentially, you know, it's, it's easy to forget it now, but like the Greek economy was growing very rapidly throughout this period. It was another example of, you know, convergence. And so in that situation, it makes sense to be borrowing and investing. Greek government debt to GDP was high, but even with the revised numbers we have now, it was actually basically flat during this period. It was, it was flat at a high level. It didn't go up until after the economy collapsed. And again, a lot of the investment was going into building, you know, very nice road systems. And the Athens Metro was very good. And you know, some stuff was things that people thought were reasonable, like they were develop, you know, they're building, not building, buying uh, submarines and you know, meeting their NATO commitments and so forth. So, you know, to the extent, I mean, obviously things could have been done somewhat differently, but. You know these things happen, and one of the reasons we talk about the example of uh, Germany after the Franco-Prussian War is because even in societies where it seems like they know what the risks are and they try to be thoughtful about this, if you get this big windfall, 
um, it's just very difficult to manage it. That you know, ultimately, it's it's you know, you get all this money coming in. You can try to be as prudent as possible in how you deploy it or save it or not waste it, but it's very difficult to do that. And some of it eventually is going to end up doing things and that you'll regret later. And in fact, that's why you know by the late 1870s, the a lot of people in Berlin were saying they should have returned the money to France that it wasn't worth getting the the reparations payments that they yeah. had extracted. So uh, you know, I mean, this is just seems like a recurring pattern throughout. History there, and across I'm countries. Sorry, because there's still something that is not uh, fully clear to me. So, going back to the example of Spain and Germany, for instance, because we know that Germany is running a current account surplus, which means that it's basically uh, spending, well, saving more than it's spending. Also, not just people's uh, uh, income and savings, but also businesses and, and the governments. And all of these savings were then uh, pushed into Spanish banks, if I have that correct. But how does that? How does this influence then? encourage Spanish private uh, private individuals to spend more beyond uh, their means, beyond what they are producing. So what happened, so just to break down all the steps there, in, in Germany, you have a situation where people, you know, households, businesses, the government are collectively spending less than their earning and income. A big part of this is, you know, necessarily, this, by the way, would not be possible if the rest of the world collectively we're not doing the reverse those things have to balance out so in practice during the, this period we're talking about it's primarily driven by german businesses that are just having a lot of profits that are not you know going anywhere in particular or they're not being used domestically they're just being essentially put into the german bank system at this point the german bank system then has to react i mean that uh you know if the way the banks work is they have their assets and liabilities have to match up. If someone is put lending to banks, then banks are going to have to be lending more in turn or accumulating assets one way or another. And uh, that means they're going abroad to find opportunities to do that if they're not finding it at home. They might try to find that at home, but if no one wants to borrow at home, then they're going to go abroad. And that's what we saw, that there was a big growth of German banks. Um, I mean, not just German banks, but German, you know, the German banks in particular, a huge um, sort of net asset, foreign asset growth. The question then is where do they where do they go and how does this work? So ultimately, you know, the only way they're able to grow their loan book is if someone else borrows. So again, there's every all these transactions have two sides. So you know, in theory, we could say like, well, we don't know which side is driving it. There's some mutual you know thing of both. But you know, this is where it's useful to sort of look at the actual specific circumstances here, and that's why we can you know that's why we spend a lot of time talking about why you know the events in Germany that sort of led to this dynamic because. If you start with, I think, when there's a reasonable baseline assumption that there are always going to be people in, you know, in Spain or in any other country where if you suddenly change the terms of, of you know, how banks are going to lend to you, then, you know, people are going to react in a, in a particular way, then that's, that's how, it, how it goes down. So yeah. essentially, the Spanish, well, you know, among others, you know, not just Spanish banks, we're talking about Irish banks, we're talking about U.S. subprime and, and so forth, but essentially, German banks went out and found entities that would be willing to create assets for them to buy. Because otherwise, this whole thing wouldn't have worked. Yeah. But doing that ends up creating extra spending power for people, you know, somewhere down the line, right? You create a financial asset. The whole point of doing that is that then you can spend more money than you have in income. It could be you use that money to buy goods and services. It could be you buy that money to buy other financial assets. Sooner down the line, though, it's about you know increasing your spending power. And uh, ultimately, you know, that is what happened. We saw that. I mean. Some of it did go, by the way, into like Spanish banks lending to other places, right? It wasn't purely a function of like, it was not a, it was not literally the case that a German bank would lend to a Spanish mortgage borrower, and that was that. There were a lot of different like moving parts and chains here. The net effect was that, um, but there were a lot of other things that were going on. So it's important to like, you know, people were, you know, looking at. I mean, you could have Spanish banks lending to Italians, or you know, would Italians lend to Germans? I mean, a lot of things. But sort of this is why it's important to sort of have this global holistic view. And so you lending, and then what happens? So a lot of people would use it to buy houses because, of course, generally speaking, it, you know, lending against housing historically has been relatively safe. You know, it's a secured, uh, you know, it's a good source of collateral. You, can, you know, if, even if the borrower can't pay you back, you can take the land. Um, but of course, if you do that, and then house prices are going up a lot, and people are richer, then they have more money to spend on goods and services. Which again, it's not a problem if like they actually are richer. But I mean, there's been plenty of studies showing that with housing in particular. Um, you know, generally speaking, that's not, you know, you have this debt booms and they, end, they tend to end badly. And that's, you know, if how I, if, I, if I may interrupt you there, because houses are not a liquid asset, right? It's not like money that you can easily use to buy more stuff. So how can this asset that is not liquid then increase the consumption of people? 
So the asset isn't liquid, but if you can borrow against it, and also if it rises in value and then you think you're richer and then you affect your own personal savings choices, then you know that will still have an effect on your behavior. It might not have the same effect on your behavior as if someone just gave you you know a hundred euro note, but uh, I mean it does have an effect. So for example, um, one of the things we saw I know it's not the same, but in, in the United States, which you know also had a housing bubble in this period, what we saw is that the the measured household savings rate um, for most people in the United States fell pretty dramatically during the housing boom. In fact, went negative. And you might think like, why would people have a negative savings rate? And of course, that's because they thought that their rising home values were doing their saving for them. If you're target, if what you're targeting is sort of a total amount of net worth or whatever, then you know some of that can be accomplished by putting away some money in a you know in your bank or whatever every month. And some of that can be like, well, the stuff that I own has just gone up by you know forty percent, and so I'm fine. <laughs> um, and yeah. in fact, if your debt didn't go up, right? I mean, obviously, housing debt in total went up a lot in all these countries, but you know that was sort of an aggregate figure there are other people other you know at points in time individuals are not having their debt going up by that much right i mean some people bought the house first their house goes up in value because other people are borrowing a lot they're feeling a lot richer they might sell their house and buy a new one so like they don't see you know the sort of debt to asset ratio might not be changing but the you know the total but like the equity the home equity is still going up a lot um so you might still be saying oh i'm being conservative because you know i'm only borrowing 70 percent or whatever of my home's value but you know, if your home's value goes up a lot and your debt value goes up a lot, then you have more money. The guy's at 30% is worth more and the debt's gone up. And of course, the house goes down, then you're a lot poorer. And that's yeah. that was the dynamic and I th that affected a lot of the people's behavior. All right. You know, indeed, at, at some point, the party is indeed over. And so if you've got all this money coming in, you know, from Germany, from China, these excess savings being invested in American and European financial markets, how does that then manifest itself exactly as you know, the financial bubbles, but also debt and unemployment? So, again, this is like, these things have to add up this way insofar as you would not be able to have the kinds of trade deficits and, you know, corresponding borrowing from Germany and Spain if it weren't also for the fact that in Germany and these other societies there was persistent underspending and, cre and that underspending you know, having these, you know, this, we'll put it another way, the profits of the German companies and so forth that uh, were then put in the banking system would not have been able to exist if there hadn't been this corresponding transaction uh, on the part of the borrowers. They were there's this I'm not going to say symbiotic, but they were they were both necessary for each other. The problem, of course, is as you said, um, there are limits to this process. That at the end of the day, if if you get to the point where the only people who are left to borrow uh, are people who have no ability to repay you, they can't even service the debt at all, pay the interest or whatever then that creates a real issue because then they're going to you know they're going to default and in theory i guess if you have the if the lenders have zero care about this whatsoever then maybe that maybe that's not a problem they just keep lending to but you know in the real world that tends not to be how things work and so you know that's where you get this sort of rapid you know negative um you know reinforcing cycle where essentially if part of the reason that lenders were thinking it was a good idea to put money into particular places so like you know the germans have you know, collectively, there's a surplus. You know, they're looking. They have money that they want to, invest, you know, put in financial assets somewhere. Some of it they don't want to put it in Germany. They think Spain is a good place because the Spanish economy is doing well. Spanish housing market is doing well. If they change their mind about that because Spanish economy is not doing it well anymore, because you start having defaults, and you suddenly don't want to, then you start, you know, redirecting. And of course, if the Spanish economy had been doing well and the housing market was doing well because of the money that had been coming in before. Then this process reverses very, very quickly because suddenly all this this positive impulse that had been coming in from more credit coming in, putting up, pushing up house prices and making them look like better assets to borrow against suddenly goes away. Then you end up in a very negative uh, spiral very quickly, and that we you know we saw that in all the sort of housing bubble yeah. countries. So essentially, and, basically, to summarize yep. what you've said, it's capital flows from sort of countries that have a trade surplus because of underconsumption. That's driving, you know, excessive debt and therefore, you know, excessive spending in countries that have, you know, a trade deficit, and that at some point that collapses and leads to, you know, excess unemployment as well as uh, trade deficits in those countries. That's that's right. I mean, there's one other ring. Well, I guess two small clarifications. One is that, you know, you put those things as sort of a, a chain of events, and <laughs> confusingly, they're all simultaneous. I mean, I understand like why oh, it makes yeah. sense to talk about it this way, but like these, you know, that's that's one thing. The other thing is that. Um, an important distinction between the cases of, on the one hand, say, Spain and Greece and Ireland, 
and on the other hand, the United States, is that in Spain and Greece and Ireland, what happened was that um, basically the extra production, you know, the, the unconsumed output from the rest of the world that ended up in those places was supplementing um, the domestic economy. And that's why you hear these booms. So, you know, the typical Span basically no one in Spain had any reason to complain at the time because, you know, Spanish unemployment was falling to record lows. Spanish, you know, basically all sectors of the Spanish economy were firing. That's very different what happened in the United States over this period. And the reason is because the United States had sort of this weird hybrid experience where on the one hand, you did have a whole bunch of imports coming in from the rest of the world. You did have a big increase in debt, but this was essentially matched at the same time by a decline in domestic production um, and domestic employment. And uh, there are a whole bunch of reasons for that. And we talk about them in more detail in the book, but I mean, essentially the part of the reason I think it was so contentious and part of the reason I think you saw the appeal of various sorts of uh, characters in, in U.S. politics over the past few years is because the, incre you know, the, the boom period wasn't really a boom for many, many people that the increase in imports was essentially displacing domestic production rather than adding to it. And, uh, you know, the debt wasn't just making it so people could buy even more stuff. It was more to replace the fact there was lost income. And that, um, you know, which is sort of an, an almost, I would say, unique to the U.S. in terms of that particular combination of, of events. But there are also sort of things about the U.S. that itself were kind of unique that, that led to that outcome. I think before we, uh, before we dive deeper into the U.S., I want to uh, make this point clear that one of your book's central arguments is that unsolicited capital flows are what causes trade imbalances in countries, correct? It's a big part, yeah. It's a big part. I mean, there, there, I'm sure there are other things that people can point to about, you know, driving. I mean, when people talk about trade conflicts, there's also the sort of wrinkle of, sorry about that, uh, okay. national uh, security implications, but if we're talking about just like the, the sort of view, oh, it's like companies versus companies or workers versus workers, then I would say unsolicited capital, you know, financial flows are a major, major driver of those things. And so, and unsolicited in the sense of, you know, <clears throat> if uh, in in the U.S., for example, in, in the in the 2000s, there was not, you know, there was there, there was plenty of available resources domestically to meet all of the U.S., domestic investment and consumption needs. This was not a situation of a developing economy where, you know, you literally cannot feed your own people and build the factories unless you import from abroad, which is a situation that's occurred many times in, in history and across countries, but it was not the case in the U.S. in the 2000s. What instead happened, and, you know, if that had been the case, then obviously imports are going to be constructive and, you know, you, you would in fact go out, you probably have companies and government go out to, you know, investors in the rest of the world and say, please lend to us or please, you know, you know, make equity investments. It will be beneficial to you and for us. And that would be, you know, solicited financial inflows, right? But it wasn't that at all. It was in fact, pure, it, was, it was the opposite situation of um, certain actors, uh, particularly but not only, um, you know, foreign central banks and, and foreign reserve managers essentially deciding they wanted to buy and accumulate a lot of U.S. dollars. And that ended up then having a whole bunch of ramifications. And you can look at, you know, the European cases are a little more interesting because, you know, part of the rationale for the creation of the euro was precisely that it would lead to more cross-border financial flows and, you know, enable convergence and stuff. So it's a little trickier to, I mean, it's, but at the same time, you know, it didn't, I, I, I don't believe that the, the way it actually worked out in that period and the magnitude of those flows, what people had in mind either. And, you know, something I wrote about separately, I don't know if this is in the book, but, um, you know, the countries that actually benefited the most from sort of foreign direct investment in, in you know, from richer to poor European countries are ones that were not in the euro. Um, and they got, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, auto factories and so forth. Um, but which is something different than what we saw in places like, you know, Greece and Spain and Ireland. So let's uh, focus on the U.S. right now, because I think it's it's an interesting case study, because it's an exemption to your argument that despite rising inequality, it does not uh, it does not run a current account surplus. It actually runs the biggest current account uh, deficit in the world. So um, how do you reconcile this? I mean, of course, you have already partially answered this yep. question. So basically, the short version is that there are countervailing forces at work. Um, there was a really interesting paper that was written about a year ago, so after we came out with a book, but um, looking at you know the impact of rich people in the United States on you know as a source of, of financing for you know, credit among the U.S. and basically what they found is that it was pretty significant, and which it sort of fits with our general um, framework of like there was a big shift 
in the income distribution, a big concentration of income. U.S. companies behave similarly to German companies after the tech bust. And so that was, you know, if that if those were the only things that had happened, you would have actually seen a very significant current account surplus coming from the United States, similar to yeah. what you saw out of Germany, potentially. But this was offset by something else, which was a huge change among household saving behavior for basically everyone outside of the top, you know, 0.1%, where, you know, went from, you know, sort of savings rate of, say, you know, 5, 10% to, you know, negative 5%. And <clears throat> so the question is, what, you know, what drove that? What was leading this sort of offsetting force? And that was, I mean, there's sort of two factors at work. One, which is somewhat less significant, is the fact that unlike, you know, the German domestic financial system, which was not as able or willing to create things like subprime mortgages to sort of recycle some of that domestically, that's one part of the story. But the bigger part of the story is, as I mentioned, this foreign demand for dollar assets that was just completely not related to sort of normal profit-seeking behaviors. It was it was um, essentially in a form of insurance or precautionary savings. It's basically... You know, the, the effect of the analogy is that basically someone, you know, suddenly was hit with a massive health care expense or losing their job. They get over it, but then they're terrified of that again. They hadn't planned for it. And so they just decide to sock away as much as they can in a bank account as emergency savings. And that's basically what happened through large parts of the world after the Asian financial crisis. Because you have a situation where a lot of countries were seemingly to, to do, you know, pretty responsible things or what was judged to be responsible by, you know, the IMF and, and entities like that. And then they end up in a very nasty crisis. Uh, you have countries which had seemingly stable, long-running political regimes that collapsed quite dramatically and quite quickly, most notably in Indonesia with, with Suharto. And, uh, you know, countries that weren't directly involved in that experience look at this and say, well, don't want this to happen to us, no matter what, <laughs> most obviously China. Um, and so then they start changing their behavior kind of in, in dramatic ways. I mean, one thing that's interesting is that if, you know, there had been talk within China in the 1990s about, you know, liberalizing the financial regime. You know, they, they're basically, you know, up until very, very recently, you basically could not move money out of China if you lived in China. And it was very difficult to put money into China if you're a foreign investor. That's changed a little bit recently, but it's, and still, but it's still pretty regulated. And on top of that, you know, again, until like, I don't know, 2005 or whatever, and even even now, like the currency was extremely managed. I mean, they basically did not let it move at all against the dollar between 1994 and 2005, and then after that for a long time, it was very tightly controlled. And But there had been talk in the 1990s before the Asian financial crisis of changing some of those things. You know, those things had been put in place you know, much earlier, and the view was, you know, China was modernizing and becoming more open, trying to get, you know, WTO membership at this point in time. Um, but then the Asian financial crisis happens, and obviously that's you know, over. And that's, those conversations are not happening again. And so, but they have a challenge because, you know, if you have a rapidly growing economy, with rapidly rising productivity, you're obviously a very attractive investment destination for the rest of the world. And a lot of companies wanted to invest in China and build factories there and so forth. In fact, the Chinese government was soliciting them. Um, part of the reason why you have the difference in labor regime and environmental regime and stuff. And the land expropriation was not just to support Chinese businesses, but also foreign companies that could come in, they could easily get land and cheap electricity and things like that. So this was, this was desired, but at the same time, you know, what normally happens in this situation um, is that, you know, that's a, that allows, you know, the people of China as a whole to dramatically increase their own, you know, domestic investment and consumption at the same time, which is what, you know, you'd, you'd want. I mean, if you have a rapidly developing country that's transitioning from poor to, to not poor, like, you know, people should be living better. I mean, then investors can get high returns. Everyone's happy. You'd expect there to be, you know, large or at least medium sized sort of current account deficits. What you saw in the United States in the 19th century, for example, or in South Korea for a very long period of time. Not what happened in China, because they wanted to protect themselves against uh, an Asian financial crisis type situation. Which one of the things that had happened there was, you know, Korea was sort of the most notable example of, you know, they they had strong growth, they're doing very well, but because they did have this reliance on foreign finance, they were vulnerable to a sudden pullback. And even though they got over it, I mean, Korea was also a country that dramatically changed its behavior, and the government responded pretty meaningfully um, to the, finan the Asian financial crisis by, you know trying to avoid that happening again. China saw that. So China's okay, well, the Chinese government basically decided the way we're going to prevent this from happening is we're going to um, prevent any kind of net reliance on foreign investment, foreign financing, and we're going to accumulate a large stock of emergency savings to make sure that we always have. And basically, the sort of simplest way to do that, you know, without is just say we're going to maintain the currency at the exchange rate and we're going to buy as much you know u.s dollars as necessary to offset any money coming in from abroad to keep the exchange rate flat 
And that ended up being trillions of dollars worth of, of purchases, which is a lot. I mean, you know, the U.S. is a large economy, but trillions of dollars over a few years is, is going to do, you know, a pretty yeah. significant impact on your on your financial system. Uh, you know, the supply of U.S. government, you know, federal government debt, which is sort of the safe stuff that would have been, you know, the most natural f- home for these kinds of savings, did not grow by that much over this period. I think it grew by about one trillion. We had the exact numbers in the book, but you know it, it grew by much less, and so you have that demand. You know, China alone. There's also oil exporters who are coming from a situation where you know the oil price is going up a lot, in part because of China. You know, after a long period, the oil price had been quite low, and they're thinking we want to save some of this windfall just in case. Um, and again, like that's a huge source of demand for for dollar assets. So, you know, and then of course there's just more broadly that like if you are a rich person anywhere in the world, you know, a, a, a large flexible market where everything's in English, the legal system is reliable and investor friendly. It's going to be very attractive to you. So you could be a Russian oligarch or, or what have you, and yeah. you're going to put your money somewhere in the U S maybe not a government bond it could be like a New York condo or whatever, but, and so all of this money coming in for these sort of non-profit seeking reasons offsets the money going that would have gone out. And that did go out. I mean, a lot of money did leave the United States in foreign investment, but you know, these things outweighed each other. I think, you know, getting back to your original question, the U.S. Government current account deficit, so in other words, the difference between income and, and spending in the U.S. sort of peaked at about 6% of GDP in 2006, 2005. In Spain and in Greece, it was well over 10%. And so I think what, you know, one way of sort of putting your question, you know, back is that if the U.S. had not had the big increase in inequality and the big decline in business investment that we saw during this period, it probably would have had an outcome more like Spain and Greece in terms of the shift in the current account balance. Yeah. Um, you know, which was, you know, more than twice the size in those places. So I think that's sort of one way of looking at how those forces offset each other. All right. So, Indy, do you focus very much on this idea of financial flows being more important than trade flows? Of course, on the other hand, you do have people, for instance, like uh, former President Trump, who said uh, China is raping America when it comes to trade. So, and of course, the proposal from, you know, people like Trump, but even from people like Bernie Sanders is that, you know, we implemented tariffs as a way to correct these trade imbalances. So why is this policy solution wrong in your view? Yeah, I mean, I don't, so I don't know about if, if Bernie Sanders advocates for tariffs one way or the other, but I, I completely agree that it's not the right way of, of looking at it. That, I mean, you know, to get back to what I was saying at the very beginning, American workers did lose out but it wasn't because Chinese workers did such a good job for themselves. It's not as if, I mean, it's kind of funny. You, you can see people both in sort of like the far right and, and sort of the center left who both seem to think that, you know, oh, well, if American workers did badly, that was the price to pay for Chinese workers doing better. And you know, there's some people who think this is a great thing and some people think it's a terrible thing. But, you know, they both think this and they're both wrong. <laughs> um, yeah. That, you know, that you could have had Chinese workers do even better than they actually did. And, you know, American workers would have done better. I mean, you know, there's no there's no conflict there. It's not a... It's not as if there's some sort of like zero sum, you know, world we all have to fight over and like there's a X, you know, this is this finite amount of prosperity. If if businesses are capable of producing things that people want and then, you know, they're not producing it because there isn't enough demand for their products. I mean, the the solution there isn't to, you know, try to fight over the demand that does exist. The solution should be to like find a way to have more people, you know, take advantage of those things. I mean, we're not in a we're not in a world where everyone's material needs are completely satiated. Um, there's plenty of poverty, even in very rich countries. So clearly, the the problem that we face is not one of like way too much stuff. I mean, there's some issue of allocating the stuff that is produced, but like broadly speaking, the problem this is we're not you know we're capable of producing a lot more, and and then we're not. And yeah. so um, this is where it comes back to the financial and trade flows, right? The trade flows are essentially residuals, right? Like you produce stuff. You're a company, you know, you have customers and all of, you know, you're just trying to sell things, right? Probably you sell a lot of things to wherever your home market is. Maybe you sell things to other parts of the world. And then if you're a consumer, you're just trying to buy things. Like you don't, you know, your re- retailers are the ones that are importing it for you. And then they're just trying to source it from wherever. And whether it's like leads to trade, you know, international trade or not, is basically sort of a function of where companies have to be, happen to be based and like residuals. And then the net flows are essentially residuals of, you know, which countries are consuming or producing more or less. And that's where the financial aspect comes into it because, you know, those residuals of producing more or less aren't a function of, you know, whether they're putting on tariffs or you know, how they're thinking about trade policy per se, it's a function of things like, well, how much of income, national income is going to people that consume it versus not, and how much of it's going to, you know, the accumulation of financial assets versus not, and things like that. And then those 
choices in turn play into you know consumption and investment and 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 show up in terms of trade flows but trade is sort of like the is that it's like a residual it's the consequence of these other more fundamental forces exactly. and that's why it's important to be th using you know that kind of framework all right so uh, i think uh, we'd like to move on i think to uh, solutions actually of course you know you, you talk very much about uh, inequality as you know the root of uh, a lot of these problems and of course as well uh, about the capital flows so what kind of solutions do you envision uh, that can mitigate you know inequality uh, being a driver of these kind of trade wars so it's funny because they're basically two ways one could you know come to the end of this and one is a very optimistic take which is well this is basically you know a solvable problem and it's a problem and the, the solution is something that's basically good for most people in the world um, across countries and you know within societies and so this is great we should be very optimistic about it the you know negative interpretation is that if this is the case the fact that it hasn't happened is you know potentially concerning and maybe reflects some sort of constraints that are in, in political systems and, and that make it challenging to actually do the changes that we want so you know whether to take the optimistic or pessimistic take i don't know but um at least within the democracies i mean there's a pretty straightforward answer which is you know we you know, social democracy is a thing that exists, exists more in Europe than in the United States, but it's a thing that like, we know how to do. If we just do a little more of that, I mean, like in, you don't need to have some kind of dramatic revolution or anything like that, or, or don't necessarily need any big policy innovations. I mean, basically, you know, the simple answer is you have some moderate income redistribution, um, particularly focused at the sort of very top end, which we know how to do those things. You have, you know, in places where governments have not been investing as much as they, they should be, whether it's the U.S. or Germany or other places, and, you know, that's, you know, you can lift that. I mean, things like that are, should be relatively straightforward. I mean, there are a couple of more specific things for countries such as the U.S. that, you know, produce this financial asset that people want, but that's, you know, a simple thing. Um, in places like China, it's trickier because, again, we know what w would help, and, in fact, the Chinese... Communist Party leadership has repeatedly said they know it would help, but they've also been saying that for you know 15 years. <laughs> How really? It hasn't improved. This? So that you know, it's not. I mean, one of the things that's interesting here is like China is clearly not some sort of centralized dictatorship to the extent that um, you know it can be portrayed as. I mean, Xi Jinping has a tremendous amount of power, but there's also clearly a lot of other actors and interests, and you know, you have to prioritize. I guess if you're at the top, what you want to have happen, and clearly this has not been enough of a priority because. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're a local government official or someone state or enterprises or what have you and so there's a there haven't been big changes there there have been some changes but not enough to really move the needle on these things so that's where you could get a little more pessimistic and then you know that's where you might lead yourself if you're saying you know the, there's sort of an ideal constructive solution where everyone ends up living better alternatively you can say well it's not going to change and therefore you're going to try to cut yourself off from the rest of the world and I don't think that's, you know, the, the optimal outcome. I mean, it might be the thing that ends up happening, but, you know, you can understand why if you're in certain countries like, and you're, you know, for example, if you were the United States or, you know, for that matter, like the UK or whatever, you might think to yourself, you know, the cost of having all this foreign, you know, finance coming in that we don't want the stores of our economy are such that we would want to, you know, try to prevent it from coming in, yeah. which, I mean, you know, that might very well happen. Um, but, you know, there are other, it's, that's one of a range of outcomes. It's not the most positive sum. I mean, that would probably be, it could be, end up one being better um, for sort of the median American. Uh, it's sort of a way of shifting the costs of, say, like, you know, a, a Chinese economic policy back to them potentially. But, you know, it's not necessarily the, the I think, number I think one indeed preferred on outcome. That point, uh, of course, you've talked very much about the inequality side of it. So, okay, more redistribution as a way of, uh, reducing that under consumption but of course there's the other side to your argument which is these capital flows and I think in your book you pro uh, sorry you propose uh, capital controls as a way to control this uh, for some people this is quite a radical proposal so how, how exactly would that work yeah I mean so essentially that would be what there, there are the short versions are a lot of ways you could implement capital uh, some kind of financial flow limits I mean actually it's kind of funny because you know it used to be this was considered absolutely um, gauche uh to suggest this sort of thing like the you know the 1990s imf would have you know completely you know said you were just some backward you know horrible country for doing this 
you know, more recently, IMF says it's fine. Um, they talk about capital flow management measures. Uh, they even have a whole acronym for it. And they, they've done a cat A lot of countries have done the varying versions of these things, um, including advanced economies. I mean, like Australia, for example, um, New Zealand have limits on foreigners buying houses um, or certain types of housing and things like that. So, I mean, that's an example of a capital flow management measure. Chile for a long time has had uh, rules that sort of limit, you know, how quickly you can take money out if you put money in. Um, so, like, it's not as if this doesn't exist. I think these things could help. I mean, one of the things that's been talked about in the U.S. has been sort of a flat, you know, essentially you pay a tax every time you buy a financial, a U.S. financial asset from abroad. Um, the practical impact of that would probably be to lead, you know, to help make the dollar less overvalued, which has been sort of traditionally one of the big consequences of everyone wanting to buy dollars. Um, again, I mean, like, I think these kinds of things could be helpful. It's sort of broadly, it's one of those things where, like, you wouldn't need this these sorts of measures if it weren't for the other things going on. So it's sort of like um, you could justify doing it in sort of a belt and suspenders approach. Like if you don't think that, uh, you know, the other, you know, redistribution is going to happen globally in the way that would be sort of optimal, then you do this as well. Um, and like your the sense which you would rely on these kinds of measures probably goes up to the extent that you have less confidence about you know, developments in the rest of the world because you can only control so much. You can only control what happens in your country. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, obviously in Europe, it's a really interesting situation because it's explicitly illegal uh, within the context of the EU. And since at least historically, much of the imbalances, you know, within Europe have been, you know, between European countries among them, like obviously that's, you know, the, you have to have some kind of alternative approach other than, you know, capital flow management measures. So that's where it gets uh, trickier potentially, but, you know, that's, um, there are potentially other options. I mean, apparently, you know, some people say that if you can have, you know, macro prudential rules that look like capital flow management measures, but, you know, wouldn't fall afoul of European law, I will leave that to uh, lawyers within the EU to figure those things out. But, um, okay. we'll see what yeah, that's, that's not really an option there, I don't think, as much. Uh, just to finish, uh, then, uh, this, uh, well, it has been a great dis uh, discussion with you. Uh, in your book title, throughout the book title, is the a theme of conflict you mentioned that there's a threat to international peace and you even mentioned the word war twice do you really think that the if we continue this status quo uh is it putting us on a path to war let's say put it that way i think it's not helpful i'll, I'll say that um <laughs> i mean you know you you can look at i mean i think we make this point explicitly in the introduction right you look at like the breakdown of international trade and finance in the 1930s and you know, I don't think that's what caused World War II, per se. You know, there are a lot of people who know this a lot more. You know, the, you can explain these things a lot better than I can about what actually caused World War II. But, like, it clearly was a contributing factor insofar as if people have sort of deep economic and financial relationships with people in other countries, you're going to be l relatively less likely to want to fight them and kill them. And if you don't, if you instead have the view that people in other countries are, in fact, the source of your own economic problems and those problems are severe, then, again, that's not going to immediately push you into war, but it might make you more willing to do that sort of thing. And so I think that's a potential concern. And, and you know, I'm not just completely making this up. I mean, Keynes at the very end of uh, the general theory, which was, came out in 1936, makes this point, you know, basically the exact same point that we make in our book. I mean, we actually, we, it's actually kind of a funny story. We we're going to quote from the very end of his book um, in the epigraph to our book, but we couldn't get the copyright for it, even though it was like 80 years ago. So whatever. But um, <laughs> Because apparently you need different different permissions for an epigraph versus in the, in the main text. But anyhow, he makes almost the exact same point, which is like, look, if, if people see trade as a source of conflict and you're trying to take advantage of another country for your own gain, that's going to weaken, you know, the framework for international you know, peace. The countries are going to be more hostile to each other. And if you have sort of a different view where trade is not thought of that way, but it's actually a way for people to, you know, exchange things in a mutually beneficial transactions, then that's relatively better off. So. You know, do I think that we're necessarily going to descend into World War III because of this? I mean, not necessarily, no. But do I think it's helpful? No, also. <laughs> I mean, I think <laughs> clearly it is a, you know, the word I think we actually, we, we use is, you know, threatens international peace. I think threatens is, is the right way of thinking about this. Like it makes, the extent that it makes things worse and, and makes people more hostile to each other, um, that's bad. And, you know, we, and the extent that it undermines sort of the global economy and threatens sort of severe crises that can lead to all sorts of other significant political ramifications, that's also bad. And so, you know, if we can avoid those things and, and come up with a better, you know, political economy for everyone, then that's clearly going to be better for, among other things, uh, peace. Thank you. Uh, I would like to quickly mention for our audience that I recommend everybody to go on to Room for Discussion social media and also Student Distant Advisor social media. 
it's a project of our own committee. Uh, we're aiming to interview all of the party leader, all of the Dutch party leaders for the upcoming elections, and the interviews will be up uh, very soon. So keep, uh, yeah, keep following us. And Matthew Klein, thank you very much for joining us today and making the time for what has been a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.